And this morning we're going to look at a sermon that I've titled The Good Life Tackles Three Tough Questions. Uh, a couple of months ago, my kids and I were over in Pooler and uh, we were doing some shopping and uh, we bought, among other things, a basketball. And uh, we needed a new basketball for our basketball goal. And when we bought the basketball at checkout, the, the salesperson said, this basketball comes with a one year warranty. Does that sound good? And I was like, well, sure. And so uh, I paid and we went out to the car and I pulled out my receipt and I noticed that there was an $8.95 charge for a one year warranty on the basketball. And my kids, you know, were like, wow, daddy's a little aggravated. I'm like, well, they didn't tell me there was a charge for that. And so I, uh, I walked back in the store, went right back to the sales clerk that had just rung me up. And I said, can I return the, the warranty? I said, you know, when you said that it came with a one year war warranty, I thought that meant it was included. And uh, you know, if, I felt like it was a little misleading. I think that uh, it makes a, a convenient sales technique, but uh, that sort of thing is not the best way to go about doing things. Like I don't mind paying for stuff, but like you, I'm sure I want to know what I'm paying for and I want to know what I'm getting. Well, where we're at here in Ecclesiastes, Solomon's going to be real honest and upfront about really what life is going to cost and what you're going to get out of it. Um, Solomon is not interested at all in painting a, a, a version of the Christian life where everything's just uh, wonderful. Everything's always easy. All of your problems just get solved. Matter of fact, Solomon's going to come at life here in chapter eight, really from this angle. I, I want to show you, even in the midst of a really bad world where lots of bad things happen, you can still live the good life. And because of that, friends, we need a faith that is not naive. We need a faith derived from scripture that doesn't take the hard parts of life and just turn a blind eye toward them. The good life, as it turns out, the life God wants you to live is a life that doesn't play pretend. It's a life that's honest about what really is the environment in which all of us live. And so our passage here in chapter eight is gonna tackle three hard parts of life. And God's gonna say to you this morning, you can live the good life even in spite of, even in the midst of these different hard parts of life. So in particular, verses one to six are gonna address the question of how do you live the good life when you have to live in a world where sometimes we have authorities over us who aren't perfect and maybe even sometimes they're downright unreasonable or even bad or even evil. How can you live a good life in the midst of that? Verses one to six will address that. Uh, verses seven to 14 will address more broadly, is it possible to live the good life even in a world where so many bad things happen? Solomon again will point our attention to the reality that, hey, sometimes bad things happen to people we would consider very much to be good people. So what's up with that? And sometimes it seems like the bad guys get away with their crimes. Is it possible to live the good life in a world where those sorts of things happen? And then finally, verses 15 to 18 are gonna address the question, is it possible to live the good life here in a world where really life is impossible to understand, to fully grasp, uh, to be predictable, or, or to be um, attainable in the sense that you can apprehend life, holding on to it, never having to let it go because it is your possession. How can you live the good life even when life is really not um, something we can grab a hold of quite like that? So that's our passage. I wanna share with you this morning three keys that you need to remember so you can live the good life even in a bad world. Key number one, you have a responsibility and here's the responsibility, to be holy. That is your responsibility. So in verses one to six, Solomon is gonna look specifically at the figure of a king, but we could really fill in the blank here for government or boss or maybe a relationship where you have to submit to someone else's authority. And the Bible essentially teaches that no matter who's in authority over you, you still have a responsibility and that is behave, right? Live like a Christian. Apply the virtues that we find in God's word to your life, no matter if the people above you in authority are good people 
or bad people or whether they fall somewhere in between. If you want to live the good life, here's your responsibility. Regardless of who is in charge of you, you need to be holy. Let's look at our passage, verses one to six. Here's what Solomon has to say. He says, who is like the wise person who knows the interpretation of a matter? A person's wisdom brightens his face and the sternness of his face is changed. So that's just a really Solomonic way of saying, all right, we're gonna take wisdom now and apply it to a new subject. Verse two, keep the king's command because of your oath made before God. Do not be in a hurry, leave his presence and do not persist in a bad cause since he will do whatever he wants to do. For the king's word is authoritative and who can say to him, what are you doing? The one who keeps a command will not experience anything harmful and a wise heart knows the right time and procedure. Verse six says, for every activity, there is a right time and procedure, even though a person's troubles are heavy on him. So our, our passage speaks you know, in, in a somewhat typical enigmatic Ecclesiastes kind of way, but here's the point. We all live in a world where we're under authority, right? We're under the authority of our, our local government, our federal government. When you go to work and clock in tomorrow, you're under the authority of your bosses. Maybe you have a relationship with friends or family members and in some fashion, you're under their authority as well. Here's the responsibility that we have. We can state it in this way. Our behavior toward authorities in our life reflects our behavior toward God. And if you find yourself in a, let's just use this as a, for instance, a country where your government does things you don't agree with, or persons maybe you didn't vote for occupy positions of power, how can you live the good life when your guy didn't win the election, right? You have a responsibility, behave. <laughs> Be a Christian, live like Christ, taught and live like Christ modeled for us to live. Here's what Paul said in Colossians 3, 22 and 23. He says, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, Paul says, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Now, re regarding submitting to our governments or uh, authorities in general, uh, not only do we read Solomon in his great wisdom telling us that the good life necessarily involves that, Jesus spoke to this, Matthew 22. Someone came to Jesus and held up a coin and said, hey, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now listen, we know a lot of things about Caesar and his ancient Roman government, and most of what we know are not good Christian things. And how did Jesus respond? Jesus said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render to God the things that are God's. Paul spoke to this, Romans chapter 13. Let every person be subject to their governing authorities. Peter spoke to this, 1 Peter 2. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. So I just give you a little broad um, outline there from one testament to the next. The role and the responsibility of every child of God toward authorities in their life is that, listen, we ought to live like Christians, no matter who's above us, what they stand for. Live like Christians. Two big truths here that I wanna leave you with. Number one, we are citizens best when we are Christians first. We are not Americans first who just happen to be Christians. Brothers and sisters, we are the children of God first, who happen, and, and I would say thankfully, have the privilege to be Americans. Our main responsibility is to be holy. Some people think that being a Christian citizen is mainly about who you vote for, but I say it's much more about how you live. Now it's not, I don't wanna draw a false dichotomy there. Both are important. As a matter of fact, I believe it's an election year. So it's a good time for us to be thinking about these sorts of things. But what makes us a Christian citizen best is the lives that we lead. The influence for Christ that we have uh, toward people we actually know. 
not what our political views are or, or, or which direction that we cast our, our ballots in. What if you vote well and you can check off every box that says, hey, I'm a good conservative Christian, but you live like the devil. We are citizens best when we are Christians first. You know, at a previous place of service, matter of fact, it was, it was 2020. It was the, the last election cycle, uh, big election cycle that we had. I had a dear church member come up to me, and I mean that, dear church member, wonderful lady, and she came up to me before a service one Sunday, and she said, Brother Deke, do you think that a person can go to heaven if they vote for a Democrat? <laughs> huh. Yeah. Now you laugh, but some of you probably want to know the answer. You're probably wondering the same thing. <laughs> and, you know, again, it was an election season. I know, I know what was on her mind. And I said, well, of course they can go to heaven if they trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation. And she goes, yeah, 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 but you know what I mean. And, and I, 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 uh, I did know what she meant. And uh, I wanted to tell her, we are citizens best when we are Christians first. Now, I would never stand in this pulpit and tell anyone how to vote. But I think you'll all agree with me that who we are as children of God, our identity as believers, very much should go with us when we step into a box and cast our vote. Am I right? as it informs the issues of our day. We should take those things with us and, and the principles we derive from God's Holy Spirit as we read our scriptures, those should guide us as we walk into a ballot box. But we are citizens best when we are Christians first. A second truth and then we'll move on. We honor God by submitting well to our authorities. We honor God by submitting well to our authorities. Um, we should do what the government tells us to do for the most part. Now, unless they ask you to do something that violates God's word, that violates your conscience as a child of God, um, we should do what our authorities tell us to. If we're called to disobey one of God's commands, that's different. If, if your government asks you to do something immoral or that violates your conscience as a spirit-filled believer, those are exceptions. But there is a very important principle that remains outside of those exceptions. We don't typically live in the realm of exceptions. We live in the realm of rule and what is normal. There is a Christian obligation and a Christian virtue of faithful participatory citizenship. And uh, I would encourage all of you toward it because it's important. So how do we live the good life in a world where, you know, maybe our governments aren't exactly what we would want them to be? Well, the first thing we should do is remember, we have a responsibility to be holy. Secondly, what to keep in mind when we find ourselves living in a world that's not always great. God has the sovereignty, so be hopeful. Remember that. In, in, in the midst of a world where there are authorities bigger than you, who have the power of the state to either compel you to act in a certain way or punish you if you don't. Always remember this, we need to be holy, yes, but never forget, ultimately no government is in charge. Our God is in charge. That's what we mean when we use the word sovereign. It's a word that represents the ultimate power of an ultimate king. Now read with me verses seven down through 14. Verses seven down through 14. Remember Solomon has called to mind a king with all of his unbridled power. And then he says in verse seven, yet no one knows what will happen because who can tell him what will happen? In other words, no one is all knowing. In verse eight, no one has authority over the wind to restrain it. And there is no authority over the day of death. No one is discharged during battle. I would say that refers to death. No one is discharged from that battle. We all are under the authority of death and wickedness will not allow those who practice it to escape. All this I have seen, applying my mind to all the work that's done under the sun, at a time, notice when one person has authority over another to his harm. In such circumstances, I saw the wicked buried. He, he pictures a wicked ruler who, who never really seemed to have to pay the price, but died and then was just buried. 
They came and they went even from the holy place. And they were praised in the city where they did those things. This too is futile. And because of it, verse 11 says, the sentence uh, against an evil act is not carried out quickly. The heart of people is filled with the desire to commit evil. It's discouraging when we see unrighteousness in the world that seems to get off the hook. And then notice something very interesting happens in verse 12 and 13. Solomon, who has this character that he portrays all throughout Ecclesiastes, he's this wise, professorial teacher, uh, ruminating on the meaning of life, and he's always holding to that character. Here in verse 12, in response to the unrighteousness he sees in the world, for a moment he breaks character. And in verse 12 and 13, you see almost a confession of faith come out of Solomon. Notice what he says in verse 12. He says, although a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, I also know that it will go well with God-fearing people, for they are reverent before him. However, it will not go well with the wicked, and they will not lengthen their days like a shadow, for they are not reverent before God. So notice he breaks character for a moment. He says, listen, listen, you live righteously before God and it will go well for you. And folks who don't, listen, it may not be now, but it'll come later. They're going to get what is their due because we serve a righteous God who really is in charge. He goes back in verse 14 and says, there's a futility that's done on the earth. There are righteous people who get what the actions of the wicked deserve. And there are wicked people who get what the actions of the righteous deserve. I say this too is futile. How can we remain hopeful in a, in a world where we observe exactly what Solomon has described? You guys have seen people you know that have done things the wrong way and they seem to have benefited from it, maybe even gotten away with it. And you think, oh, sooner or later they'll get what's coming. And then you've seen good folks who live life the right way who never seem to be able to catch a break. How do we make sense out of that? And, and we have to, we can't pretend it doesn't exist, it does. We must remember God is sovereign and we must find hope in that truth. So how do we do that? Uh, one simple way, you've gotta to learn to preach to yourself. And the first little application I wanna make for you as we remember God's sovereignty, you've gotta to learn to preach to yourself. I think that's what Solomon does. As he's here giving this discourse on, on the meaning of life, he can't help but in verse 12 and 13 to take a step back and say, yeah, but I know God really is in charge, right? We can't see everything and our perspective, even for those who live the longest among us, is only around 100 years or so. God sees it all. He knows the end from the beginning. Righteousness will win the day. Unrighteousness will sit at the judgment of our righteous and sovereign king, Jesus. And we must remember that. We got to learn how to preach to ourselves. Now, listen, I'm glad you're here today listening to me preach. But it's so much better if as a child of God, you can learn to preach to yourself. When you encounter evil in the world, when something goes wrong, when you wonder why did things in my life have to develop and turn out this way, you've got to learn like Solomon, like where we see in a couple other passages of scripture, to be able to recall and apply the truths of God's word to your life in a way that will give you hope even when you're going through very difficult, seemingly hopeless times. And so well, one passage of scripture that really comes to mind for me is Lamentations chapter three. In, uh, in Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah is, is speaking at great length about how difficult life is. And then he comes to verse 21. Lamentations 3, verse 21 and, fo and following. He says, but this I call to mind, right? He remembers something and therefore I have hope. And what does he call to mind? What is the message that he preaches to himself? These words, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. 
and it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let me tell you, when, when God inspired Jeremiah to write those words, Jeremiah was, was trying to live the good life in really bad days. And by the Holy Spirit's presence in his life, he was able to recall to mind and to preach to himself some really important truths about God. And it made a difference in his life. And so just ask this question, what are a couple of things Solomon would want you to preach to yourself to help you remember God's uh, sovereign? Number one, that God is in charge. Always remember God is in charge. Here's the problem. Everywhere we go, just about every single day, we encounter a world that will do everything in its power to convince you he's not in charge. But he is in charge. Are you familiar with the, the psychological term gaslighting? You know what it means for somebody to try to gaslight you? It's to try to convince you of something that's not real. Uh, I say psychological, I'm not even sure if that's the right term, but I do know it often takes place in abusive relationships where, where you have a stronger personality and a weaker personality. And the stronger is always talking down to the weaker, telling themselves, uh, telling them things that aren't necessarily true, but for the stronger person, they're useful to manipulate, to, to get what they want. It's called gaslighting. Um, I, I heard an account of this just in recent weeks. Uh, back in May, there was a police department in Fontana, California that awarded nearly a million dollars in a settlement to one of their citizens. As it turns out, back in 2018, there was an adult man whose elderly father went missing. And when they couldn't find him, the police thought that the man killed his father to try and collect um, an insurance check. And they held him in custody and interrogated this man for 17 hours. And of course, the whole thing is recorded with video and with audio. Now, the man that they were interrogating, turns out he had some mental issues of his own and was in great need of medication. And after so many hours, when they wouldn't let him access his medication, he started to lose it. And the more and more those policemen told him, we know you did it. You killed your father. Just tell us what you did with his body. The more and more they did that, the more and more he started to believe it. At one point he was in such anguish, he started to pull out clumps of his own hair and he tore off his shirt and he confessed and said, yes, I did it. And the next day his father showed back up, perfectly healthy. He had taken a trip to see a friend and he didn't tell anybody. They gaslit him. Well, that gaslighting really is a form of, it can be very much a form of emotional abuse and trauma. I tell you that story because when we live in a world that gaslights us every single day into forgetting who's really in charge. Our God is in charge. Remember that. Bring that back to your mind and your heart when you're, when you're suffering, when you're struggling. Preach that message to yourself. What else can we preach to ourselves? Not only is God in charge, but God will right every wrong. The Bible teaches without any doubt, there will be a judgment day. And God will make right every wrong that has ever been done. If you believe that God can raise Jesus from the dead, Certainly you can believe that our God is a righteous judge who will have his day in court. And let me tell you, if it feels like unrighteous things have gone unnoticed, remember, our God has not adjourned court. He will still have his day. And so we trust him and we do the right thing and we remember he is in charge. Let me share with you this morning one final uh, key to finding the good life, even in the midst of a bad world, and that's this. Not only do we have a responsibility to be holy, not only do we need to remember that God has sovereignty, so we ought to be hopeful, but lastly, Solomon closed our passage by reminding us we have an opportunity. And what is that opportunity? To be happy. To live the good life 
life. Notice what our passage says in uh, verse number 15. It was such an amazing passage of scripture, which really is a meditation on the problem of evil in the world. And in verse 15, Solomon says this, so I commended enjoyment, happiness, joy, because there's nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat, to drink and enjoy himself. For this will accompany him in his labor during the days of his life that God gives him under the sun. Now our passage goes on to articulate really the the futility of trying to understand why everything happens the way that it happens in this life. But I wanna wanna highlight this notion of happiness and just draw out a few applications for you. Number one, God wants you to be happy. And I really mean that. Solomon here, who is as, as stoic an author as you will find anywhere in the scriptures, Solomon says, hey, if there's one thing I can recommend to you. Remember, he said basically everything in life is futile or, or, or vain. But here he'll make this um, unabashed recommendation. If I could recommend one thing for you, it's this enjoyment, happiness, joy. I commend it to you. To commend is to sing the praises of something. He says there's nothing better than this. The best thing you can do with your life is to be happy. And how do we do that? Well, we we, we have to recall all that that Solomon has set up to this point. Remember, the good life is what? It's the God life. It's recognizing he's in charge. He's good. And so we surrender to him. Life is a gift. Enjoy it. Be grateful for it. Life is meant to be experienced, not bottled up and put on a shelf so you can pull it out at some point in the future. That's not how it works. We don't know what the future will hold. Now, some of you this this morning, you may hear this recommendation to be happy and and you may feel a little extra um, spiritual, maybe more spiritual than the rest of us. And you may say something like, no, no, the, the best thing in life is not to be happy, it's to be godly. And I would say, there's no difference. They're the same. You just don't understand godliness or happiness very well. They go together. I don't mean some sort of superficial, oh, everything's great. I'm going to put a smile on, even though on the inside I'm crumbling, right? I'm not talking about that sort of happiness. I'm talking about a deep, abiding sense of purpose and meaning and joy that can find incredible meaning in the smallest things in life. When we enjoy God's gifts well, we enjoy God, the giver of those gifts. If we can learn to treat every meal as a feast, every loved one as a treasure, and every day as a gift, we can learn to live the good life. Solomon closes our chapter number eight really by saying, don't try to be God. Right, the last two verses of chapter eight say, if you try to figure everything out, you're really not going to get it all figured out. God is creator. We are but his creatures. Accept the life that God has given to you and enjoy the happiness that he intends for you to have. You know, I wanna close our our time of preaching um, really by thinking about something that's at the heart of our chapter, which is that there's bad things that happen in the world. How do you live the good life when there are bad things that happen? Well, as a Christian, here's how I would answer that question to close. What's the worst thing that could happen to you? I think the worst thing that could happen to you, certainly one of the worst things that could happen to you personally is that you would die and then be judged for your sins. I think that's about the worst thing that could happen to you. Let me give you some good news. 
the worst thing that could happen to you has already happened in Jesus Christ who died and was judged for your sins. And if the worst thing that could happen to you has already happened, well, you can just go on about your life now, right? And live and be happy. We don't have to worry every single day with all the variables for what could happen or what might happen. Jesus has already taken care of us in the, in the deepest way possible. And with that, he has purchased a freedom for you to enjoy the good life. I, you know, I, I'll give you a good example of this. Some of you will like this, some of you won't like this. I remember a few years ago when Georgia Bulldogs won their first national championship with Kirby Smart. You know, they won two in a row. Uh, for some of you, that makes you cringe a little bit. I remember the first one. I watched that game. I had COVID at the time that I watched that game. And so I'd get so excited, I'd start coughing. It was awful. And uh, I was a nervous wreck. I stood the entire game. I did not enjoy it at all until it ended. And I told Lauren the next day, um, our wives are so sweet to humor us as we go on and on about sports. Uh, I told Lauren the very next day, I said, you know what? Later this week, I can't wait. I'm going to watch the game again and I'm going to enjoy it this time because I already know what's going to happen. Here's how you can live your life. The worst thing that could ever happen to you has already happened in Christ. He died for you. And the best thing that could ever happen, that your sins would be forgiven, that you'd be filled with, with the power and the approval of God, that, that you'd be given a fresh start, a clean slate, a new life. It's already happened. So you don't have to watch this life of yours in dread or fear of losing. You can live in the freedom to pursue the good life. That's what Jesus has purchased for you. Let me invite you, if you would, to bow your heads. We're, we're closing out our time of preaching a couple of minutes early because we're going to observe the Lord's Supper in just a moment. Before we do that, though, dear friend, have you given your heart to Jesus?